everyone and welcome to uh warren new jersey in our c19 studio <laughs> i'm john resso and uh to the right here i got jim de palma he's going to be answering your questions chris and eric are running the cameras and three different computers and uh we're uh, ready to take off here um on your screen on the right side you got the little bar where you can go in you can post questions, you know, if you want to, want to, want to ask a question or you need something answered, uh, don't hesitate. Jim is going to be right there manning the questions throughout the presentation. Um, if you need to email me, you can email me there at jresso at wellsdarby.com. So today we are going to go over the multi-position air handler. We happen to have one here with the front covers off of it. So we're going to touch on that. We're going to touch on a little bit of the, uh, the marketplace as to, uh, where your opportunities may lie. So we will get started here. So Fujitsu has launched a two, two and a half, a three and a four ton, and they're AMUGs. This is what we call an AMUG. And uh, this is a multi-position air handler. They have a partnership with Ring Rude. So the outer jacket is basically from them but the internals here are controlled, are, it's Fujitsu controlling. So we have now a multi-position air handler that we have the ability to modulate up and down to match the demand within a home, no different than a typical mini split system. The difference here is we are now ducted where a majority of the time when we're talking mini splits, mini split heat pumps, we're just talking strictly about a, you know, one-to-one, -one outdoor unit to indoor unit within the space and no ducts. So with that being said, um, just reach right out to Jim De Palma now, if you would, and just give me an idea of what you guys are doing in the field as far as the SEER rating on your outdoor units and on those outdoor units with the SEER rating, are you using a single stage outdoor or a multi-stage outdoor unit? Uh, for any type of installation that you may be doing. So just shoot some of that information over to Jim and uh, we'll keep rolling. So as I said, they, Fujitsu did partner several years back with the Rude Ream uh, world and the outer jacket here, as you can see on the PowerPoint slide, they look exactly the same. Um, the difference is we take and have an outdoor Fujitsu unit with side discharge air. And on the indoor unit, we have the same capabilities as the conventional market does. And uh, you know we're able to put this into four different positions, but what we do differently is uh, the way we drive this. And we are able to modulate it based on our components on the indoor and outdoor units. So we still have the inverted DC compressors on the, on the outdoors compared to a scroll type compressor on a typical conventional system. Our metering device. So on a typical system, you have a TXV valve. On our system, we have an EEV valve, electronic expansion valve, and that is still mounted in the outdoor unit. So we have the ability to meter that and uh, look at exactly what we're doing. On a typical conventional system, you might have ECM motors on there, which is great. Uh, that definitely gets you little more efficient. Uh, we have the ability to vary the fan speed of the indoor unit and the outdoor unit. So we're going to be able to match them loads much closer than a typical system would. We also continue the Fujitsu norm where we power the outdoor unit and then the outdoor unit sends power to the indoor unit to drive the indoor components. All right, different than a typical conventional system, you're going to power the outdoor unit with one circuit, you're going to power the indoor air handler with a second circuit. You, you, you may get into a second circuit with this multi-position air handler. Uh, we do have an opportunity here for some auxiliary electric heat. We'll touch on that a little bit later. So depending on the demand, you know, that's where we'll live uh, as far as a breaker goes. Depends on what, you know, if it's a two or two and a half ton if it's a three or four ton jim anybody respond yes uh anthony responded 16 to 18 sear two stage okay 16 to 18 steer two stage good that's a great starting point and and they're paying up a little bit for that when you get up to those higher sears they're going to pay up a little bit for that so that's good 
So the highest tier we're going to be here is 19. Um, but we do still have the EEV valve. So that is a 500 position valve. And that basically, you think of a nut and a bolt with a needle on the end of it, and the nut and the bolt can adjust up and down, and it will hit the seat and adjust accordingly. So that's a 500 position valve. Normally we use about 380 different locations across that valve, and that's uh, how we modulate the refrigerant to the indoor unit. It's all gonna always be based on demand, based on temperatures, resistant values sent from the indoor coils back to the outdoor unit. So good starting point there. So let's just uh, break this down. You know, um, Jim and I always have conversations about uh, just business in general. And we always say, you know, he, he, he asked me one day, we actually did a podcast on our HVAC insiders a while back. He asked me, he said, if you were going to business today, what would you do? And I had told him, I said, you know, mini splits, tankless water heaters and condensing boilers. And I would focus on them and I would be an expert on those items because there's so many out there. I'd you know, pick a couple and be an expert on those. So my turn to step up and do the multi-position air handler. And we've done two or three different presentations and we got technical and we you know, can show you how to flip the coil and do a lot of different things. I want to approach this a little bit differently. I want to know from a business perspective, where can my business go if I were a contractor, where can my business go utilizing this piece of equipment? So I went in and looked at some, uh, you know, U.S. market numbers on furnaces. So in 2018, the base market, $115 billion market. So you have the opportunity and you probably are currently working in that marketplace. So that's that's the market. Um, by 2026, they they're saying here in this in this status here, it's going to be a $200 billion market. And you can see I highlighted New York and New Jersey as being part of you know, that main footprint as to where this market will continue to grow. So pretty interesting to me when I, when I started doing the research here and finding this, see how big the market truly is, and to see where my opportunity lies and, and where do I go with this new multi-position air handler that Fujitsu is offering. Right. So I went one step further and I just wanted a little snapshot of January, February 2021. What's going on in the furnace market? Well, February 21, we can see 658,000 gas furnaces have shipped and another 6,000 plus oil furnaces have shipped. And if you look at the increases there, we're talking, you know, 50 and 30% increases in furnace shipments into our marketplace. So those are big numbers. So that tells me, you know, this market is still very vibrant and I have an opportunity as a businessman. And I was joking with Jimmy the other day, I said, this is where efficiency meets opportunity, right? Because heat pumps are really efficient. And looking at these numbers, that tells me as a business person, there's a ton of opportunity here. How do I capitalize on that? What do I look for? How do I go to market with this? So I just put together a couple of slides. Where do I install this? You know, how do I find that market? What do I look for? I can go in, you know, with blinders on as a salesperson, and I can go in and change out like for like and keep moving forward. My thing is, and, and we always have this conversation here at Wells Darby, is we want to get the right appliance into the right application. So this may be the right appliance. It may not be, but I want to just show you here. So if I had a unitary system, you know, maybe it's an old heat pump system and I have an opportunity to make a change out there. You see a horizontal unit. This can easily be flipped into the horizontal position. I no longer have a 75 decibel outdoor unit. I have a smaller outdoor unit. Um, I can get it up out of the snow. I can generate plenty of heat or we'll go through some heat values and I can support the air conditioning within the home. Now, this is not going to fix insufficient ductwork. All right. We do make a 0.1 static, uh, you know, 1.0 static, no different than you see in most furnaces, but this will not fix bad ductwork. I just want to be clear on that. So everybody's on the same page. 
Um, to the right there, you see a gas furnace. Uh, I put up there oil furnaces. So it could be a typical uh, unit where, you know, we're going to go horizontal with it. We can go left with the air, right with the air. We can go down through the bottom with the air. Depends on the application, but this is a multi-position air handler. It will go in four different positions. And we have the opportunity to replace several different types of heating systems out in the marketplace. So everybody loves that big 275 gallon bottle of Chanel number two right there. You get that on you, it stays with you, right? Take a little bit of that oil, dip it on your neck here, you're perfect, you're good to go. So oil boilers, right, could be aging out. Or maybe we just wanna take and put air conditioning in the house. Uh, we have the opportunity here, maybe we keep that oil boiler, but we want it to run less, and we only want it to run when it's down below a specific temperature. We have the ability to put a hydronic coil onto this unit, and we can tell that hydronic coil when we want it to become the primary heat source. So maybe we look at 17-ish degrees and we can allow that oil boiler to come on and supply hot water to this unit. And we use the auxiliary heat side and we set that up in our, in our wall controller and we tell this when we want the heat pump to be the primary heat source and when we want the hydronic system to be the primary heat source. So this doesn't have to be the primary source for the home it can be but we can work this into a hydronic system where someone may have a hydronic system they had a, a fan coil like i'm showing there on the right they had a fan coil within the home with no air conditioning you have the opportunity to put this in use a hydronic coil and now you can give them air conditioning also so I'm just giving you a bunch of different roads to go down when you're looking at a specific replacement and giving you different options as to how do I apply this to real world applications, right? These are all real world applications here that I've shown you in the last two slides. So, and I, that leads me to the next slide, which is 2009 and 2013. This is showing the proportion of natural gas type heat in the Northeast, electric heat in the Northeast. They're really the only two categories I'll look at. So the uh, natural gas um, is yellow on the chart to the left. The natural gas is green on the chart to the right. And we're focusing on that upper right there, the Northeast. And if you look at the little blue swash on 2009, and then look at it, the electric, the blue in 2013, you see that electric market is starting to grow. So that has a lot to do with heat pumps. So if you're doing heat pumps today, great. You're, you're, you're in the sweet spot. That market is growing. If you're not doing heat pumps today, this is a market you really need to look at a little bit and you know, reach out to us. We'll be happy to come out and train you up on Fujitsu, uh, get you up to speed as to what is the best product for the application. So I always like to back things up doubles. I just, that's the way I do my research. It's got, I got to see it at least twice to believe it. Um, and most times I'll go even further than, than, than just two times. So this right here, it, you know, this backs up that strategic electrification. So here, this is all US homes. The blue is basically homes that are heated with warm air. So we've seen that once, that's the, that's the lion's share of the business. And then yellow right here is heat pumps. That's for the whole U.S. home market. And then this breaks it out by single family and right across apartments, you know, all the way across, even down to mobile homes. So just a good snapshot of what's going on out there. The chart over here to the right, um, and this is all 2015. This is the latest I could get. This one right here is the Northeast. So that's kind of the market we focus on. So this takes me from 1993 all the way to 2015. And yellow is electric. So we can see in 2015, we have more homes heated with electric heat pump. And then the blue is electric and at least one other fuel source to heat the home. Again, the blue has grown. So back to talking about the boiler with a hydronic coil on top of a Fujitsu unit and using this as primary heat and full cooling 
And then when it gets really, really cold outside, maybe down into the single digits or the low teens, I turn my boiler on and I send hydronic heat to this and I just use this as, a, as an air handler. And that's the options that you have here. And, and I've kind of reinforced it with these charts showing you that the market is trending that way. So we like to bring more than a dozen donuts to our training, right? Because we feel we have more information than just handing you a, a sugary donut. This is the information that we like to bring to you guys so you understand what's going on in the market. You're so focused on your business it's our job to bring you that market knowledge so you know what way to steer your business going forward. So that's what I had for just market information and strategic electrification and everything that's going on uh, in our industry. Now we'll jump back into where do I put this thing, right? I, I, I have an opportunity. It could be a new home. It could be a retrofit, new construction it will fit into all those type applications, right? So now I need to find a home for it within the house. Do I have a knee wall, an attic? Is it gonna go in the basement? Uh, if I go sideways, you know, horizontal, left or right, I can put it in a crawl space. Not that I wanna work in that crawl space, but we have the opportunity for that. So wherever you have room in the home, we have a four position air handler that will fit that need. So there's the outdoor unit. Again, it's a typical Fujitsu outdoor unit. This is a typical air handler that we've taken and installed the Fujitsu controlling mechanisms in. So now we have the ability to modulate. We put our thermistors on here instead of a TXV valve. So we're, we're monitoring the temperature of the coil and we know when it needs refrigerant, whether it's hot gas or cold gas going into the home to heat or cool the home. We're monitoring that constantly with our thermistors. So this was built to be less than 2% air leakage. So it's a very tight unit. Again, that speaks to the high level of efficiency that Fujitsu wants to achieve, um, even down to the point where we give you um, little gaskets that go around where the pipes are. So after you make your connections, you can slide this on and that seals up around the piping to make sure that we stay under that 2% leakage of the unit. So a lot of focus on, on efficiency. This right here, this is showing us again, we got a 24, a 30, a 36, and a 48. Um, the two smaller units, the 24 and the 30, they will cool down to minus five degrees and they will cool all the way up to 115 degrees. The 36 and the 48, um, they cool down to 14 degrees. So if you have an office space, and they may host meetings in the winter time. And, uh, you know, this room we're in right now, we could probably host 26, 27 people in here, up to 30. Um, not obviously not, not COVID times, but um, pre COVID, we could have 30 people in here. Well, that's a lot of person load in the building. So it could be November, cold outside, but we still need some cooling to offset the people load. So if I have the two larger units, I can cool down to 14 degrees outside. If I have the two smaller units, the 24 or the 30, I can cool down to minus five. So that may be an advantage. That's a big advantage over a conventional system, right? You just can't do that with a conventional system. On the heating side, we can heat. Well, I shouldn't say we can heat down to minus five. We rate the unit down to minus five. Okay, this is a heat pump. At minus five, it does not shut off it continues to produce heat. We just don't rate the BTU below minus five degrees. So um, we'll show you some charts, some heating charts, and, and show you where those uh, different BTU ranges are based on temperature. Because our unit lives outdoors, it's looking at outdoor temperature. This one's inside, it's looking at inside temperature. They communicate back and forth, and we rate them based on that. So again up to 19 sear so this is just a breakout um, in your handouts today uh, you have the ability to download this catalog this is the latest and greatest uh hot off the press we got them in here a couple of days ago i had to wrestle chris to get this away from her um she didn't want to give up this one but here it is it's in front of you 
She put it on the on the uh, on the webinar so you can download it. All of this information is uh, is there for you. Um, our SEER ratings, our COP, everything is on here. We are 17 SEER on our 48, 18 SEER on our 36, 18 and a half on our 30, and 19 SEER on our 24. So if you do a heat load calculation, you'll figure out which one of those you need, and that'll give you your SEER rating. If you look at the HSPF, which is our heat rating, um, everything is above 10. So that's, uh, that's really good. We produce heat efficiently. We produce air conditioning very efficiently. So this has the potential to save you a, a lot of money over a typical old conventional system. Again, I'm gonna say this again, we cannot fix bad ductwork, okay? If that old ductwork is leaking and you put this in, guess what? That ductwork is still gonna be leaking. So make sure what you're connecting it to is proper size and sealed in order to make sure you're giving your end user, the customer, a, uh, a good job. Breaker size, we're looking at a 30 amp breaker for the two smaller units, the 36, uh, 24 and 30. And the 36 and 48, we're looking at a 40 amp breaker. Now we do have the auxiliary electric heat. We'll touch on that in a little while. If you're putting that in, you're gonna have to have a, you know, a second breaker for the electric heat. The electric heat is not powered by the indoor unit. It's gonna be powered by a separate circuit from your, from your panel, okay? And then this here just goes through and, and we show the sizes and the dimensions. And then here, we just threw it up there. Um, all the units that we've been talking about so far are single outdoor fan, okay? When we marry up to some of our competition, in order for them on a three and four tons, they go to a dual outdoor fan, so the unit grows. Um, that may work, it may not. It depends on where you're gonna locate your outdoor unit. Uh, if you got a window above or something like that, that could be a, you know, a little bit of a problem. Here we show you our dimensions on our, on our two, two and a half ton, our three and our four ton. And we also show you it against conventional. And again, these conventionals are all top, right? All our air is gonna flow out of the top. Our Fujitsu's are all gonna flow out of the side. So just some dimension differences. Here, we're, we, we just take a step into the, the noise world. Um, our outdoor units will be between 53 and 55 decibels. That's considerably less than our, our uh, conventional competition. So here we could be seeing upwards of 75 decibels from an outdoor unit. So again, noise sensitive people, this may be an opportunity. It might be, you know, Outdoor units, the old units were small, the unit, new units are extremely large, right? People have a fence up, you can't get the new unit through the gate. You know, there's a bunch of different reasons. Just keep your eyes open, see what the best appliance for that application is, whether it's a unitary product or a Fujitsu uh, mini split, it'll be what it'll be. Okay, but again, that sound, we definitely uh, definitely clean up on the on the noise factor here. So here we're looking at our outdoor, there's our outdoor unit. Why are we much quieter than a typical unitary unit? Um, we use some acoustic insulation that goes around our compressor in the outdoor unit. So that really takes and deadens the sound of that outdoor unit. Uh, we also, our fan is horizontal where a typical uh, unitary system is vertical. And if you look down in there, the compressor's right there, not insulated. Um, you know, so all that noise just gets sent up through the fan and out and upward where we reduce that noise before we get rid of it out the side. Also good for snow. If you do plan on using that as a heat pump, you know, you're, you're vertical. You're always going to have a snow load wanting to get down there on top of that unit where we're going out sideways, horizontal. So here, this really gets down to the meat and potatoes of the unit. Um, this is right out of the design and tech manual. This is an AMUG 36, okay? So these are rated to five degrees for heating. That's where we stop the rating. Again, it does not shut off. That's just where we stop it. So this 36,000 BTU unit at negative five degrees outside 
and 70 degrees inside will still produce 28,830 BTU. So if you're using this just for air conditioning, we have the same type of charts in the design and technical manual that will give you the air conditioning performance at specific temperatures outside and desired temperature inside. We'll give you the BTU ratings. We feel that this is gonna be in a lot of heating type applications. So we wanna make sure everyone understands where to get this information. Uh, design a technical manual, it's by unit, and it will tell you 70 degrees inside, 72 degrees inside. Whatever I wanna look at here, I will just take the target temperature in the house, I'll look at the temperature outside, and I'll just follow that across until the two meet. And let's say I'm looking at this right here, it would give me 32,470 BTU, right? So that's how you would utilize that chart. Fujitsu, I would say in 98% of the comparisons that you do, Fujitsu will always win on the heating side. Okay, so we make a ton of heat. And I will just show you a 36,000 BTU unit from one of our competitors. And they rate theirs at minus four. At minus four, they deliver 21,000 BTU of heat at 70 degrees within the home. Matter of fact, this is a 36,000 BTU unit, and it never delivers 36,000 BTU of heat ever. I'm just going to go back one slide. Here's the Fujitsu chart. Okay. So 70 degrees inside. And I'll just follow this down. At five degrees outside, we're delivering 32,000. At 14 degrees outside, we're delivering over our rated 36,000 BTU. And it just grows from there. So usually when it comes to heat, like I said, about 98% of the time, maybe a little more than that, Fujitsu will win on the heat side. So don't be afraid to use these as a primary heat source. My son has a 36H model in his house. That's all he has, it's his primary heat source and our desired temperature outside is zero. So here in New Jersey, where I'm currently standing, outdoor design is 14. Long Island, maybe 15. So here's the performance at 70 degrees in the home, 14 degrees outside. I follow that across. This 36,000 BTU unit will be delivering 36,750 BTU of heat. So if I were to do a heat load on a home and a cooling load on a home, I now have the ability to go into these charts and find out exactly what size unit I need based on my design temperature of outdoor, which here it's 14. If I needed a three ton system, I could purchase this three ton heat pump system. And at 14 degrees, I could deliver 36,750 BTU. That's impressive. So don't be afraid to use these as a primary heat source. Jim, before I switch gears, how are you looking there? Everybody, everybody awake? I think they're awake, but no questions. No questions. We will keep rolling. So we have different options for electric heat. This is the uh, one of the electric heat systems. This plate right here would be removed. This would slide in. That would become your electric heat. Um, this one has a breaker with it. These two wires would be removed and you will take and power this directly from your panel. So we have three different versions here. Um, well, four, there's three different frame sizes, but there's four different um, KW sizes. Here you can see for a two ton, a two and a half ton, three ton, and a four ton, what it would look like 
And again, this is the location where it would be installed. We also offer a filter uh, rack system. Um, filter rack does not come with the unit. If you want to put a one or two inch filter in there, you can purchase the filter rack and, and mount it to the to the bottom or the top of the unit. Um, one thing here, or, or if you got a downflow and you're going to go down through a floor, combustible floor, you want to buy this uh, this little downflow base kit, and then you're going to want a fire seal all the way around it. So that's important. Uh, one thing to remember here, we're never going to cut into the sides like a typical furnace. A lot of furnaces, you can pan off the bottom and then you'll cut the right side or the left side. Some even give you an option for the back. Um, on these units, we're never going to cut any of the jacketed panel that comes with the unit. The airflow is always going to be in this scenario, bottom to top. We lay it on the side, left to right. We lay it on the other side, you know, left to right, right to left, uh, or you know, reverse the air the opposite direction. Four position, airflow up, airflow down, airflow uh, left or right. But we're never going to cut into the jacketed area here. Uh, that comes with the unit. So that's critically important. For two reasons, we're not going to do that. One, we may end up cutting the coil. Two, which is probably even more important than that, is um, we will not get the correct airflow across the coil. So you may not have the ability to heat or cool the home properly um, to the whole installation. So um, that's critical. The Standard unit out of the box comes with our typical five, uh, seven year compressor, five year parts. That's going to be standard. If you are on the Fujitsu toolbox, on the Fujitsu portal, if you're on there and you just register this, if I do this install and within 60 days I register the unit, that will automatically take the compressor and parts up to a 10 year warranty. And if you have the ability to do 20 outdoor units a year and work with our ET or our CSD group, training uh, training group, you need 20 training points and you need those over a two year period. They'll last you two years. So once you get 20 training points, 20 installs, you have the ability to be classified as an elite contractor. And that allows you to up the warranty to 12 years on the compressor, 12 years on the parts. Okay, that also helps with lead generation. The higher you rank on that Fujitsu portal, on that Fujitsu website, the more leads they will funnel your way. So we talked about application. We talked a little bit about the marketplace. Uh, we'll just touch on install here for a little while. So from an install standpoint, um, you know, we're going through this. Obviously, I don't have a manual that I'm reading out of. Um, I don't have all the tech data that I'm going through. I just picked out some things that I highlighted and there, that is correct information. So don't use this as a full blown training for installing a piece of equipment. You really have to go through the manuals in order to do that. Um, so if you have the portal access, Great. If you don't have portal access for Fujitsu, you can go to Fujitsu General Portal. You can go in there and sign yourself up. Just use your email as your password or register now. And within 24 hours, they'll send you um, information you need to hop onto their website. And on that website, you have the ability to find all of this information that's currently on the screen the installation manual, installation instructions, design and technical. That's going to be one you're going to be in quite a bit. Um, ton of information in there. The service manuals, uh, you know, all about the integrated electrical kits and uh, product bulletins and, and everything you need as far as information to install this equipment correctly. So it's always very important to be safe when you're doing this. Um, we deal with, in the mini split side of the business, uh, we deal with AC voltage and DC voltage. So we want to make sure that you're working safe. Uh, AC voltage kind of gives you the hands-off type effect feel. Uh, DC voltage will actually pull you in and lock your hand up. So we want to make sure we're working safe. Um, always know when power's on, 
mini split world, we have uh, capacitors and different things in the outdoor units. So when we power them down, we want to make sure that, you know, we leave them off for two, three, five minutes, whatever your company policy is, let them de-energize before we start working on them. So work safe. So this is the unit, right? In, in this configuration here, we have the, the coil on the bottom. So our coil, it's an end coil, right? Up, down, up. Right above that, we have our blower, we have our control package, and then electric auxiliary heat would be here. And right here is where we would wire in our wall controller and uh, whatever else additional items we may end up using. Uh, we have some opportunities to wire them in there. Right here's our connection points, okay? Connection points are the same size across the line. So we're talking 3 8 5 8 uh, across the whole line. So that's nice. You don't have to worry about, you know, what line size do I need? Uh, we do have an internal drain pan. It is located here and here. So when we take this and we put it down onto, uh, let's see if I'm facing it, it'll be my left side. So I'm going to lay it down on its left side. I don't have to change anything. I'm, I'm good to go. So two different ways I can use it out of the box in the position I have it here, or I can lay it on its left side. This is the breakout upflow. That's what we're looking at right now. Lay it on its left side. We're going to have left airflow. If I'm going to use a right airflow or a downflow, that's when I have to take and you know pull out this coil. I'm going to make some changes to it. Um, we give you with the unit. We give you the material you need to connect to the top of the unit to to uh, make a plenum. So your plenum will tie right in. Let's put it right there. And then if you have to rotate the coil, we also give you the brackets uh, to help you rotate the coil. There are simple marks in the side of the jacket where these brackets go and the screws go. So it's 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 really easy. You guys are mechanics. If you work with any multi-position air handler, just because it says Fujitsu on the front doesn't make that any different. You're still going to rotate it and 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 reconfigure. The one thing different here is uh, we use thermistors instead of a you know TXV valve, so to speak. So we will have to relocate the thermistors. Uh, ones right here, you can see it, and uh, retie them. We give you the plastic ties and everything with the kit. We also give you the insulators for the piping, and you know we want to make sure this is sealed up and uh, going to work properly. Excuse me, John. Yes, sir. Just um, uh, reiterate the sizes for the line set again. Yeah. Uh, three eighths, five eighths. Okay. I believe. Okay. If I made a mistake there, I'm sorry, but I think it's three eighths, five eighths. Well, you know what I'll do here? Let's go recheck, fact check. We're going to do a quick fact check. Fake news. No, no fake news today. <laughs> That's right. Let's get back here. Sorry. Oh, you know it. All right. Where are we here? Let's see if ends. All right, Jim, you're going to fact check me. Yeah. Sure. You can fact check me. Thank you, sir. All right, we'll clean that up. Sorry about that. Jim is going to do the research. There's our positions. Um, yeah, 3H58. 3H58. Good deal. Okay. So, this is the area that we need clearance during an install. We, we absolutely have to have 24 inches worth of clearance on the front side in case you ever have to work on the blower, clean a blower wheel or something for maintenance. So we would need that uh, that amount of clearance. Um, if you ever had to get in there and clean the coil, um, you're going to want that 24 inches minimum in front of the unit. On the sides, not too much. On this side, you may want to leave the right side. You might want to leave you know, that four inches or more. Um, depending on what else can move within the space. So important to have the clearances. This one is the most critical right here. You got to have the room up front. It's an absolute must. And then uh, you also have some opportunity for your electric tie-ins up top. But, you know, once you get your plenum on there, you still have room for your electrical connections. So that's, that's uh, not a problem. Never cut the side of this jacket. I said it once, I'm saying it again, and I'm showing it 
you know, showing you why here on the PowerPoint. Um, it will definitely throw our airflow off. If you were to cut into this side, um, you got a big drain pan right here. So we'd never get air across that coil. So always air is gonna be in the orientation that I have it, bottom top, left, right, never through the sides. Okay, again, if you're gonna flip it vertical, there we're showing you the drain pans, right? There's just a blow up of it. And uh, anytime you're gonna use it in this position, I'm sure the inspector is gonna want you to have that fireproof caulk around the, around the unit. Uh, also, you're gonna wanna take and put some type of supports on the side, uh, especially when we put you know down onto, maybe it's a flanged or earlier in a presentation, I, I showed uh, an air handler sitting on duct work. Uh, we're always gonna wanna make sure that this is gonna stay vertical. It's not gonna move. It's gonna stay directly on its duct work. Um, if you do use it with a plenum underneath it, make sure the plenum is a heavy enough gauge to support the weight of the unit. That's important. And you do have to use, if you're gonna go down through the floor, you do you should use this uh, floor base. There, here we go with the coil rotation. So there's a jacket on the front of this. You're gonna take all the screws out for the jacket to take that off. And this is gonna be the same on all models. Here's your, your coil is here. So we're basically gonna take and we're gonna cut cut away at these little uh, tie straps, get those out of the way. We're gonna be able to lift that coil out and you can see here horizontal right to downflow. We're gonna turn it 180 degrees. This will be the same on all models. You're gonna rotate that 180 degrees and then you're gonna reinstall it and then you're gonna remount your thermistors and you're gonna put your tie straps back on all the, uh, all the wires hold the thermistor wires in place. Um, I know I went over that really fast. I didn't go step by step. That's in all the manuals. Most of the, most of the guys probably on this call could school me on how to rotate this. So I know you guys have the ability to do it. If you're unfamiliar with it, um, I'm sure Fujitsu is gonna have a, uh, a video on their website at some point, but uh, in the manuals, it gives you step by step by step. It's not, it's not a hard process. Um, our guy Rob says he can do that in his sleep. Which he probably has done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just an interesting question that comes up a lot of times in our Fujitsu classes. And a question came up today. What if there's a pre-existing line set and it's hard to get to? Can I change and use that line set versus our 3H5H size that we're recommending? Okay, so line sets. This is 410A. And um, we want to make sure we have a clean line set. So to reuse an existing line set would would be, you know, a, a hard no, um, especially if it's not the correct size. We've been on several jobs where, you know, a contractor has come up with every reason why we couldn't use the proper line set, including a three foot stone wall. So they decided to hook up the line set that was existing, he did flush it. I give him credit for that, he did flush it, but he hooked up to the unit and uh, we created a rainforest. Uh, if we don't have proper line size, remember mini splits have a very small accumulator in the outdoor unit. Remember mini splits, um, you know, you, you don't hear me referring to the mini splits as a condenser and an evaporator, right? So the lines on a mini split are always going to be insulated. So if you use, uh, you know, this Isotech UV on the job, um, both lines have to be insulated because at any given time, you know, we're either using our outdoor unit to flash off refrigerant or we're using our indoor unit to flash off refrigerant. So both lines need to be insulated, number one. Both lines need to be sized correctly, number two. We have to make sure we get the correct amount of refrigerant to the unit because we're doing that based on a resistance coming from this thermistor. We're doing uh, our refrigerant control based on the outdoor unit sensing temperature through about five different thermistors. 
All right, a typical one to one, we're looking at upwards of 11 thermistors, nine to 11 thermistors on a on a one to one unit. So if, if I'm seeing these resistance values from my thermistors, but I don't have the highway to pass the refrigerant through it, right? I'm supposed to be on a four lane highway, but I'm on a two lane road. I can't get the refrigerant there. So the unit will never run properly, nor will the refrigerant know where to flash off. So I could create a tremendous amount of condensation that you know I just can't handle in this pan or a wool unit can't handle it. And it'll blow that into the, into the home. And we don't want to get moisture into the ductwork. Our goal with air conditioning is to take the humidity out of the air, right? We want to, we want to pull that humidity out. We don't want to add to it by not having proper line size. So that's a hard no on reusing the lines, uh, especially if they're not the correct size. Uh, we prefer new lines, new install. Let's just get it off on the right foot. Save yourself a bunch of aggravation. Uh, here we're showing you those rails. If you have to rotate it, again, the dimples are here. Uh, those rails are just to you know, support the jacket, support the coil, allow it to slide into that groove and uh, just keep a good sound jacket. Got a long rail and a short rail. There's the dimples that I was talking about on the side of the unit. So that's, that's really good. It's simple. It's right there. Okay. That's how it would line in. Put them in, long side, short side. Your coil will slide back in, and then you're going to remount your thermistors. Okay, pretty basic. I know you guys probably know how to do this without me even telling you, but um, the unit itself, you know, make sure you leave yourself room for maintenance. Um, this is might be this is might be the uh, old hindsight thing, right? When I'm hanging this, I don't want to have my support brackets on the front side because these jacket covers have to come off. I want to make sure I get them around the side. So I have easy access to the panels, easy access for maintenance. When I'm supporting this, if I hang it like we did in that last photo here, right, that's hung from the, from the upper rafters, um, we want to make sure that we support the whole unit. Don't expect this to be your support system. This jacket is not designed to be your support system. This jacket is designed to, you know, box this out, hold the coil, hold the blower, and insulate. It's not a support structure. So go use best practice here, right? Run a full square channel around, then attach it, and make sure, you're, again, you're attaching outside of the jacket. We need to make sure we can get these covers off. If you are going to take and screw that to the unit, be cognizant of where your coil is and use short screws. We don't want to use an inch and a half long screw and run it through the coil. If you're going air downward, so standing up like this, but we're going to have air going down, um, you're always going to want to use an L-type bracket here, pretty rigid bracket. We want to make sure this thing stands up properly. Um, the reason for that is we're getting some additional weight at the top, so the unit now becomes top heavy, okay? So we want to take this, the A coil will be, or the end coil will be up here. The blower will be underneath it. So now we have a top heavy unit. We're going to put these L brackets up the side of the unit, support that, and make sure that the unit doesn't have the ability to tip over on us. Right here is our refrigerant connections. Um, this is nice. This comes to you pressurized. We have five to 10 pounds of nitrogen in this coil. So if you go to break this loose and you don't hear the nitrogen wanting to escape, look around, make sure you're, there's no screw through the coil, make sure there's no damage to the coil. Um, if the nitrogen is out of that coil, um, something happened. So before you go any further, you may wanna repressurize just this coil and, and double check it to see if there's a leak or if, if there's been damage somewhere to the coil. So that's a nice feature. It really helps on the install, help you understand. Yes, I, I did hear the little five pound swoosh when I loosened up one of those nuts. The coil has held, it's installed. I'm now ready to go to the next step. On the drain pan side, we give you two plastic plugs and the opportunity to drain. So depending on the orientation of the unit, 
you will pick which one of these works best for you. If you want to do a single, if you want to do two, you can remove this plug. However you want to do it, whatever, you know, whatever your company policy is, whether it's one drain or two drains, um, that's that's going to be up to you. Make sure, you know, always plug these if you're not using them. Be careful when you uh, when you do this, don't put 10 pounds of Teflon on there and go to turn it in and end up cracking the pan. So just remember, it's, you're working with you know a, a plastic product. Make sure when you put that PVC adapter in there, we're not going to over tighten it, stress it, and crack it. This is important. Also, we need at least a three inch trap, right? Three inch trap, so that as condensate comes out, goes into the trap, it will trap the water. We want to make sure that this blower does not have the ability to pull that condensate back into the unit. So that's why we request that three inch trap that will make sure that the blower does not have the ability to overcome the condensate and pull it back in. Good question for the group. Uh, is there enough line set coming out to press your line set in instead of flaring it? Ah, Jim, what a great question. And I just so happen to be prepared for that question. <laughs> Jeez, send that guy a $20 bill. Yeah. Uh, so we're also, we're the, we're the Connex uh, ACR press guys. Um, we have, and I happen to have right here in my hand, this is a Connex ACR uh, press connector, and this is going to be 45 degree flare, which is exactly what we're looking for in the Fujitsu world, in the mini split world. And then here we have the ability to press. So we would take our line set, run it into here, and we would press this, put a little bit of 410 refrigerant oil on the back side of this flare, put a tiny bit on the face of the flare, and then this will go directly to the air handler. Use your torque wrench, torque that down, and you have a solid connection. You just repeat the same process with a little bit larger, the 5 eighths flare to press fitting, come right off of here, and we can press, uh, you know, flare that, uh, use that flare and press it right on. So. Shameful plug, but uh, you know we do have the uh, we do have the fittings, and we got the latest and greatest uh, Isotech UV. So you got the additional UV protection, and if anyone's ever dealt with formicary corrosion, uh, we have a coating on the outside of the copper. Now it's a clear coating that gets baked on, and what that'll do is that'll resist any corrosion to the outside of the outside of the copper. So um, if you have any questions about that stuff, you can just you know, email us, call us, let us know. I'm sure you have a contact here at Wells Derby. Uh, if not, we'd love to, love to meet you. All right, two other questions. Still going with the flare. I don't truly really understand this question. If you're still relying on the flare, is there enough to bypass? Um, no. No. I mean, uh, no, because on the 5H gym, there's an elbow right here. There would not be enough to get a pressed coupling on there. Okay. And um, the 3H, there probably would be enough. But, man, you'd be your connection, one connection would be inside the jacket. One connection would be outside the jacket on the 3H line. The 5H line, there just is not enough meat there. Okay. Right. Um, so let's speak to that for one minute, right? We, in our top 10, class that we do, we talk about refrigeration leaks because it's a big deal. So we know of several scenarios with companies where, you know, they just have a have concerns. Number one, flaring tool, cutting tool, that's very important. Um, we all have contractors that we work with closely. I have a contractor I work with very closely and he called me and said he can't make money installing Fujitsu. I said, oh, time out. Tell me more. He says uh, he's chasing leaks. So I approached him with the Connex. And uh, I said, you don't even have to buy it. You know, I'll give you my tool. You can use my tool. Do a couple jobs. Use my tool. Let me know how it goes. Unbeknownst to me, um, he now owns four tools. And every Fujitsu job they do is a press job. And uh, he is now very profitable with Fujitsu. So 
this has helped them dramatically. Um, I, I actually did a class there and I had all the guys go out to the truck and get their flare tool and cutter. And uh, 11 flares were made. Four of the 11 flares were good. So we identified the problem and we solved that problem uh, by hooking him up with, uh, with Connex ACR press fittings. And now he's uh, successful with press. Okay, so moving on, it's never a bad idea to have an auxiliary pan when you go horizontal with these units. Uh, we do have the drain pan internally, but it's never a bad idea to have a auxiliary overflow pan. We have an uh, opportunity here for you to use a couple of different connectors here, one and two on the unit for an auxiliary float switch. So this has the ability to shut the unit down if I don't know, let's say your condensate plugs and now you're overflowing into the auxiliary pan and you want to shut that off before it overflows and goes into your insulation and sheetrock. If it's in the attic, um, we have that ability here uh, through the one and two connection ports. We talked earlier about how the you run your power from your panel to an outdoor disconnect. From the outdoor disconnect, you run that power to your outdoor unit. So depending on the size of the unit, um, we're gonna take 14 gauge wire from the outdoor unit, 14.3, make sure you have that ground. It's extremely important. We're on 14 gauge wire and we're gonna power this unit. And from the unit to the wall controller, we're gonna run anywhere between 16 and 22 gauge wire, um, preferably two, we can do it with two wire. Uh, we can take and run that from the unit to the wall controller and tie in that wall controller and that's all we would need to hook up this unit from the 208 230 perspective 14.3 with a ground and from the it's actually going to be a dc voltage that goes from the unit to the wall controller okay not a 24 volt circuit it'll be a dc current so same thing here on the 24 and 36, we're going 14 gauge indoor to outdoor and uh, 24 and 30, I'm sorry, 14 gauge indoor to outdoor. And it could be two or three wire, but most of the time we're using two wire on the controllers. On the larger units, the 36 and 48, it'll be eight gauge power supply. So from your panel to your disconnect, disconnect to the unit will be eight gauge from the unit Outside to the unit inside will be 14 gauge, 14.3. Grounds are extremely important. Think of these as computers. We want to have the grounds mounted properly. We want good tight ground connections. Um, we have a lot of uh, communication going back and forth on these lines and we need to make sure we can, we can decipher whether it's an AC or a DC serial signal that we're seeing. So that's why the grounds are so important. Okay, here we're just looking into we're just looking into the unit itself. Right up here is where we're going to have our connection terminals. This is where all our wiring is going to take place. Um, this is where our external inputs would be. Our control transformer is here. Um, this is our control panel, our control board. So this is the Fujitsu technology. If we have an auxiliary uh, heat source uh, on the electric heat source that uh, you can purchase separately. It plugs directly into the board. That, that's only for communication. That does not power the electric heat. That is, again, a separate heat source. Uh, back to the wire. Does it matter? Stranded, solid, solid. Okay, so just how wire works in general. So if I use a solid core wire, um, communication works really through the core of the wire. So if I use a solid core wire, really the, the, the sweet spot, so to speak, is the dead center of that wire. So I wanna make sure if I'm using a solid core wire, I don't just loosen up the screw, plug the wire in and then tighten the screw back down because I only have that one opportunity for communication. If I'm using a solid core wire, I like to see that wrapped as far around the unit, you know, I'll call it 360 degrees around that screw and then tighten that screw down so I have a full, connection point all the way around. If I have stranded wire, I have several wires and the core of each one of those strands is where the communication goes through 
So I have a better chance of stranded wire giving me a stronger signal than I do a solid core. The downside of stranded, and we see this all the time on installs, is guys will just tighten down on the stranded and you'll have 10 strands that are out here that aren't touching anything. And then the rest of them are partially wrapped around the screw. So you may want to use a connector on there with the proper, you know, press tool to get it crimped on there properly. But um, usually stranded will carry a better signal than solid core. But either will work. It's just a matter of, you know, neat and clean and, and full. The more, the more surface area the screw can touch, the better the connection. Excellent answer. Thank you. Okay, so here is, there are options out there, guys. This does not come with a wall controller, okay? There are options out there. I'm gonna give you my personal opinion and I shouldn't do this, but that's the controller right there. The UTY RN RUZ-4. Um, this makes your life extremely easy. And I say that because there are function codes on this unit that you're gonna wanna set up. And this is the, one of the easiest controllers to get into the function code settings and make those changes. It's just a really nice wall controller to work with. Um, this came from our, our VRF, our variable refrigeration flow side of the business, the air stage side, the commercial side. This is a product that was brought down into the Halcyon product world, the infinite comfort series product. Um, this is definitely the control of choice. And all we're looking at here is connecting two wires, Y1, Y2 are gonna go to the wall controller. And then my Y1, Y2 terminals are right here. I'm gonna tie that in. And that's gonna give me my communication from my wall to my indoor unit. Installation in general, what would it look like? Again, from my panel box, with the proper breaker size, with the proper wire size, I am gonna bring out my L1, my L2, and a dedicated ground, right? So I need three wires going out there, L1, L2, and ground. And that's gonna take care of going to my disconnect box. Never a bad idea to have some type of surge protector or a surge or a uh, voltage monitor if you have a generator system, right? Never a bad idea. Leave the disconnect box, go into my indoor unit, tie or my outdoor unit, tie everything in. L1, L2, ground. Then I take my 14.3 and I run from my outdoor unit. I run that wire all the way to my indoor unit. This is where we see communication errors. So if I have black, white, red, and that's one, two, three, black, white, red. Just make sure on your indoor unit, it's one, two, three, black, white, red. And um, that's important. If it's, you know, you, you do black, white, red outside, you do red, white, black inside, you're gonna have a communication error. So that's in our top 10 presentations that we do all the time, because we see it quite often. Just get your wire pattern set up. We don't care what it is. Black, white, red, fine. Tie them together. The ground here, we have to have that ground. We have forward communication and reverse communication going over these wires. It's serial communication. It's how the indoor unit talks to the outdoor unit. We also have 115, 120 volts going in on wire one and wire two. Wire three is our one of our serial communication wires. And then we use one and two as the other serial communication wire. That's why the ground is so important. We need to be able to separate that signal and know if it's AC voltage or this serial pulsing coming back out or going back in. So critically important to get that right. I don't care which model we're talking about. That's mini split world in general. So um, very important. Go, Jim. All right. I'm not sure if this is going to be in another slide or two, but uh, does the static pressure self-adjust? Yeah, we're getting there. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Leaving me right in. Send that guy $5. Well, now he made 25. Oh, 25. <laughs> He's killing it. Yeah, good for him. Um, on the back side of the uh, UTY RN RUZ4, there is a switch. Um, it's very important to turn that switch on. That will enable the memory. Uh, if you don't turn that on and you have a power outage, any setup you've done within that uh, controller 
will be washed away and it'll go back to factory orientation. So by hitting that dip switch, and then you go in and make function code settings, which we're gonna talk about here in a minute, um, that's a good thing because you're gonna to wanna to set this up, you know, dial it into the home. Uh, this will hold, if I lost power, you know, for approximately a week, this will hold all of those function code settings that I made changes to. So make sure you do that. That's important when you have the cover off and you're wiring the two wires in the Y1, Y2, hit that dip switch at the same time. Now, we have another dip switch. So on the controller, right here, you got a dip switch bank of four and a dip switch bank of three. We're currently talking about the dip switch bank of three. So SW101 switch three is factory set to the on position, okay? This allows the fan to run um, one minute after the unit has shut down. So if I have electric heat or anything like that tied in, this will allow that fan to make sure we cool we cool down those electric elements, okay? So if you're using auxiliary heat, you can leave it on. If you're not using auxiliary heat, you can shut it off. Doesn't matter. Um, but I would shut it off if I'm not using it. So static pressure. Static pressure on this unit, again, it's 1.0 static that we can produce. Um, this static pressure will adjust based upon the ductwork that it's hooked to. Uh, will it fix bad ductwork? The answer is no. Uh, may it work a little better? Um, maybe because it modulates, but that is still not the answer for bad ductwork. This will also, it won't monitor the filter and how dirty the filter is or how clean the filter is, but what it will do is has to build the ability to adjust the fan speed to hit its static pressure numbers. So let's say I have a brand new filter. I may be running my blower. I'm just gonna use random numbers here at uh, 1500 RPM. And as that filter starts to get dirty, you know, I'm hitting that cycle, whatever it is, three months, whenever I change that filter, um, maybe now my blower has to run it, uh, you know, a little higher, 1800 RPM or 2000 RPM to overcome that dirty filter to make sure we still get the correct amount of air into the home. So we do have, we do have that ability the, the fan is, is constantly adjusting itself based upon the Mr. Readings of the indoor coil and of the outdoor temperature and of the room temperature. So that's a constant adjustment. And they don't have to worry about setting it, which is really, really nice, right? So here, this is the fan delay. Again, we're talking back into these, these little dip switches and that switch is, that, that's really hard to see. So uh, I'm gonna go right on. Number 40 here, this is a function code setting. And if we are dealing with that controller, we can go right into function code settings. So 40 is auto, rest, uh, auto restart. So I wanna make sure that this is always en enabled. And um, so it would be 40 would be zero, zero. And that means if I have a power outage or anything along those lines, this will automatically come back and restart on its own. It will not need anything from uh, you know, a service company. Function code 43, and you may want to take a couple of notes here. It says cold air prevention. So function code 43 comes out of the box as enabled. Function code 43 has to do with um, um, basically how we control the indoor blower working with the outdoor unit. Uh, if, I, if I disable this, I lose the ability to control the modulation of the indoor unit. I may wanna disable it for a short period of time. We prefer on this unit that we power the outdoor unit 12 hours before we start it. Uh, we know that's not reality in most applications because most of the time you're trying to do a job in one day. So I bring that up because, you know, we always talk about how an install should go. And we always like to go inside in the morning and do the inside work when we're clean and then go do the outside work 
and you know we're getting dirty kneeling down and setting up our stands to get the outdoor unit on um when you're doing these you may want to just rethink your installation practice a little bit it may be a good idea to get the power to the outdoor unit first get that outdoor unit powered so we can get the crankcase heater on get that that uh you know any moisture that might be in the oils uh boiled off and and uh get the outdoor unit ready to go but if you're done with the install let's say you you got your electric on first thing in the morning and you're done with the install it's 3 30 in the afternoon it's cold outside and you want to fire this thing up you can go to function code 43 override the cold air prevention and that'll allow the outdoor unit to start up come on and start sending hot gas to the indoor unit if you don't override that the outdoor unit may come on it'll run at a low rpm trying to heat itself up once it gets i think it's 77 degrees once it gets the compressor to 77 degrees and the oils and the refrigerant to 77 degrees it will then start to uh, send refrigerant to the indoor unit so always make sure you go back though if you disable that make sure you go back and enable it before you leave the job site if not you probably will be back there with a service call from the homeowner complaining um, about the airflow within the home all right our 25 dollar guys we were coming up with some good questions good, here good. Michael, michael's uh, really into this which is good so he asked about you know do i have control if i'm going to run secondary heat and you already discussed that yes uh, you know we have the ability to hook that up as an auxiliary but then you want to know and maybe you want to explain this uh about having access to the function codes or i guess maybe how he has access to function codes yeah so that's why i like that controller right. is because basically it's a touch screen and right through the maintenance portion of that controller you can work your way right into the function code settings and on all of these units more than likely you are going to be making adjustments to the function codes um, especially these two right here that i have on the screen right now 42 and 48. Uh, currently out of the box this is no different than any other fujitsu unit where we do all the sensing at the indoor head we do all the sensing at the indoor air handler and in a lot of applications where this may be in an attic that's not going to work as well as you want it to the other thing about your install location, if you are putting this in an attic and it's a unconditioned space, you know, the rafters aren't spray foam, the insulation is underneath this and all your ductwork is insulated, it would not be a bad idea, it would probably be best practice to also put an insulation blanket over the air handler because we are sensing temperature here. This is different than conventional, guys. Um, it's gonna work much more efficiently. It's gonna, I'm sure it's gonna keep the homeowner very comfortable but we take temperature readings at this coil. So we need to understand that and we need to address that. So you may end up with an insulation blanket over this jacket if this is in an unconditioned attic. And because of that type of application, and we've seen them in that type of application already, you're gonna to wanna to go to, to code 42, function code 42, and to function code 48. And you're gonna to wanna to take and tell them 01. They're gonna come factory 00, which means it's sensing at the indoor unit. We're gonna to wanna to change that to 01, which means it'll sense at the indoor unit and at the wall controller. And we're gonna to go to function code 48. We're gonna tell it the same thing. It's gonna come out of from the factory as a 00. More than likely, you'll want to take and put it to zero one, um, especially if it's in a cold type attic. And then we'll be sensing at the wired remote. So these are two function codes. I would almost guarantee you, you're going to be touching, unless this is in a basement in a conditioned space. Um, but after changing function code settings, always remember, you have to completely power the unit down. The whole system, power it down. Wait your five, seven minutes, power back up. That takes that function code and it burns it into the software of the controller. So now the controller, if I lose power, another reason why we hit that dip switch, right? So it remembers everything. Uh, if I lose power, these will be burnt into the software. Anytime I do a function code setting, I have to make these changes. 
So more into function codes, emergency heat enables emergency heat. So with this unit, and these are function codes that most of us have never really gotten into, but here we are with the ability to really expand and, and, and the reason I gave you so many opportunities to utilize this piece of equipment at the beginning of the presentation was because I knew what was coming at the end of the presentation. So we now have the ability to go in here and, and work this piece of equipment through function code settings to where we can make it work with either electric backup or a hydraulic heating backup. So what that does for me is if I have an error code, if I have an outdoor unit failure, I still have the ability to run the indoor unit with either my electric heat or with a hydronic heating coil on this unit. So I now have that old boiler that, you know, if, if it ran a full season, I would probably replace it in the next four or five years. Now I'm only gonna run that old boiler to send heat to this hydronic coil over my Fujitsu unit, and it may run 10% of its normal run hours. So now I, I've extended the life of that boiler and it becomes a secondary heat source. So back to one of those charts where I showed you, you know, electric and at least one other fuel, and you've seen those numbers growing, you've seen those blue lines growing on those charts. That's why I brought those charts up because I want you guys to understand the full picture, the full scope of the ability of what this unit can do, all right? This is not your typical unitary type piece of equipment. We have a lot of ability here and going deeper into some of these function codes really identifies what you have the ability to do. So our team here, and we're gonna reach out to Fujitsu, we're gonna to put together kind of what we call a standard hydronic setup. So if you had a hydronic coil, we're gonna go through and we're gonna list out all the function codes that you should go in and adjust. And then we're gonna put a second one together that if you're using the electric uh, heat backup, electric street strip heat backup, we're gonna put a second page together that will identify all the function codes that you should go in and make adjustments to, to make that work as the best system that it can. So probably within the next month, we'll have those all put together. Reach out to us if you want a copy of them, or if you're starting to install a bunch of these, we'll be happy to share that information with you. Again, that'll be a, a Wells Darby uh, CSG group, our team, along we'll reach out to the, to the folks at Fujitsu and just bounce what we feel would be a good setup for our footprint, bounce it off of them, make sure they agree, and then we'll have that available. Because this is gonna be used in, a ton of different ways. And you will have the ability with all these different function code settings um, to make those changes. So here, this is just a master check, uh, checklist, right? Has the indoor unit been installed correctly? You know, you, you know, if you have a supervisor on a job or you got a service manager, um, eventually your techs will be able to check these boxes for you. You know, has there been a check for gas leaks, refrigerant piping? Uh, obviously, you're going to do that. And when we check out a Fujitsu system, remember, you might have to get a new set of gauges if you're not doing this, but we got to get this up well over 500. We want to be up in that 600 range when we're doing our gas pressure checks. Um, that copper I showed you earlier, that's all pressure tested to 700 PSI. Uh, all the Fujitsu equipment is good for 700 PSI. So ramp that pressure up, identify a leak if you have one. You know, heat insulation uh, works completely. So again, those function codes, this is what we're saying here. If you do this installation in the middle of uh, summer and all anybody cares about is air conditioning at that point, you may end up having a service call to go back there and set it up for heat. So just make sure you're going to make all those function code uh, changes when you're there on the job. So you're not going back. Every time you go back to the house, you're making less money. I don't have to say that. Um, you know, check your voltages, make sure your power is right. Put 208, 240 to this unit. Okay. Um, you know, that's the other thing, too. You know, when you get into those air handler change outs, if it's a real old air handler, it might only be 120 volts upstairs. And the wire may not be large enough to handle uh, 240 volts with a new indoor, indoor unit. Where this goes into place of that unit, and now we're powering it from our outdoor unit. 
So we need to get the refrigerant lines up there. It's just as easy to get the electric line up there. So just little things to think about. Again, right appliance for the application. And we can go through word by word by word here and go down this checklist, but um, I'm not gonna read every one to you. This is just best practice. This is what we would recommend as best practice before you leave that job site. Make sure you check all the boxes. That's very important. Okay, so at the end of the day, why Fujitsu, right? Why would I switch from what I'm used to doing? We've been doing it that way forever. Um, so why Fujitsu? So I threw this slide together, just basically saying, you know, number one, Fujitsu has a ton of online training. Number two, Fujitsu, we have the home field advantage. Fujitsu's US headquarters is right here in Pine Brook, New Jersey. Just moved from Fairfield uh, a year ago. So we have a home field advantage. We have a uh, air stage on Broadway in Manhattan. They have a facility in Manhattan with all working air stage equipment, okay? Fujitsu offers home financing. You, you don't offer home financing, uh, that's a big deal. You may be able to close a lot more jobs. In addition to offering that home comfort financing, Fujitsu spends money out of their pocket and they buy down the interest rates. So in some applications, you can offer the homeowner same as cash. In other ones, you'll have a bought down interest rate. So they're not paying credit card rates to install a Fujitsu system in their home. Okay, uh, rebate center, go to the rebate center, you can go to Fujitsu rebates, just click in Google, Fujitsu rebates and it will give you all of the units that qualify for rebates in the New York, New Jersey footprint. The warranty, five, seven out of the box, 10 year if you register, 12 year if you're an elite contractor. Um, if you're doing multiple brands of mini splits and you're achieving over that 20, you may wanna focus in here, try to jam in 20 Fujitsu units. We'll be happy to get you the 20 training points and now you can go a step above your competition and offer 12 year warranties. That's a big deal. That is a big deal. We also have the Fujitsu infinite assurance plans. That is the ability for you as a contractor to deal directly with Trinity, which is a warranty company. And you have the ability to offer up to a 12 year labor plan on this unit so if you go out there and there's a service problem you have the ability to get paid labor and possibly not have to bill your homeowner anything depending on what your rates are so you have that ability fujitsu has put all these programs together to try to just make it a whole package and then it's installed and then you have to service it so that's where the wells darby team comes in right we will show you what it takes to service a unit. We'll tell you, we'll teach you we'll, whatever you need for your technicians. We're here to support that, right? That's what we're doing right now. Um, in addition to that, Fujitsu has launched this item here called Zendesk. This gives you as a technician in the field, the ability to go on to Zendesk and you can look up just about anything you wanna look up under Zendesk. If I wanna find out how to take a board out of an outdoor unit, I can go on to Zendesk, I can go in there and I can find that specific unit and they will show me screw by screw instructions on how to take that board out of that unit and replace it. And there is a ton of different videos in there like that. And to go one step further, um, everything is app-based these days. Here we have Fujitsu Mobile Technician. So if I'm on a job site and I have an error code, I can easily go to my Fujitsu mobile te technician app, I can look up that error code and it will take me all the way through the steps of how to solve that problem. So why Fujitsu? There's a whole screen full of reasons why Fujitsu. In addition to that, it's one of the destination brands in the mini split world. And um, it's, it's actually, it's a, it's a really good, it's actually a great product and we have a ton of opportunities, um, especially now with this multi-position air handler. Uh, our growth has just been unbelievable 
with with the Fujitsu product line. So, with all that being said, we really appreciate everyone spending this hour and a half with us. Uh, we're going to get you out of here a minute or two early, so we greatly appreciate your time. Uh, myself, Jim De Palma, Rick Costa, Anthony Tosti, Rob Clemens, and Jim Fry runs our department. Uh, if you need anything from us, please reach out. We'd be happy to help you. Come to your shop, train you. We do things a little different now with COVID, but we have still have the ability to do that. Uh, we are running several hands-on type programs that we would normally run in the field. We have multiple cameras here. We can do that here. We have uh, multiple trainings come up coming up. If you look at our HVAC Insiders website, um, HVAC Insiders with an S dot com. You'll see all of our upcoming training, whether it's here at our Wells Darby studio or on the road, you'll see that training on that site. Uh, we also put recorded versions of our training onto that site. So if you have a technician that you want to sit through something, you can go on there, look through all the different programs and uh, pick out whatever it is that uh, you may want them to learn. And if you need more, let us know. So with that being said, Jim, if you are good on questions. We are good. We're getting a lot of thanks. Uh, just hang on a sec here. Yep. Units only going to be used for air conditioning. Do you have to insulate the jacket opening on the insulated attic? Um, jacket is insulated, but still never a bad idea. If it's a really humid, really humid attic, it's never a bad idea to put an insulation blanket over it. The cost of it is minimal compared to what the repercussions could be. So never a bad idea to insulate it in that unconditioned space. And then one last question here, no options to add additional indoor units to this system. At the current time, there's no options to do a multi-head system, but what we will have in a short period of time is to do a multi-zone system off of this air handle. So stay tuned for that. Rick Coster touched on that in one of his classes. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, if you go to, if you are on the Fujitsu portal, go to what's new. And when you go in under what's new, you'll see a, a, an air product uh, with dampers. So we'll be able to zone this type of equipment. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, I didn't want to throw too many teasers out there. I don't want everybody's head to explode this early in the morning, but um, we really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you, everyone. Everyone in the room, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you next time.